and uh, we're live with Karen. How are you going? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, great. Thanks so much for coming on to to have a chat. Um, you just did an amazing job with the uh, recent nutritional optimization masterclass and a couple of data driven fasting challenges. And I just love seeing where people put all the pieces together. And we've always said that, um, you know, we're nutritionally agnostic. We don't really care whether you're on a carnivore diet or a, or a plant based vegan diet or somewhere in the middle. We've tried to create the tools that enable people to gamify the nutrition and solve the puzzle of nutrition. And, and you were an awesome example of that. And I just wanted to show people um, what you achieved as introductions. So this is sort of our holy grail, and we'll get to explain that a little bit later. But this is um, Karen's micronutrient fingerprint, and um, that's hard to do with a perfect score of 100%. Um, she topped the leaderboard. Um, it's pretty funny. We had uh, City down here from, I think she's Africa, or traveling all around the world, eating head cheese and these amazing, um, you know, weird and wacky organ meat combinations. And, and then Karen comes in and tops the leaderboard with a vegetarian diet with a, a perfect score of 100. And um, I suppose we're not promoting one versus the other, but it's just great to see that people can do it from any dietary approach. Um, you dialed up your nutrient density score from 77 to 100, and you were saying that you probably started maybe at 30 before you started data-driven fasting and sort of worked your way up, just yeah, dialing so in a little bit. I added a lot of protein over the several months before. Yeah, maybe we'll talk about protein a little bit later. In the masterclass, you lost 7.2% of, of your body weight, 12 pounds, um, 2.1% pounds of fat loss in the masterclass, 6.4% of your body uh, of your fat. And um, over the two data driven fasting challenges in January and, and March, dropped 16.2 pounds of body weight, 10.5%. That's a, that's a massive change and um, massive congratulations to you. So Thank yeah, you. How, did, how did you get to this point? Um, you're obviously very motivated and um, talked to Kelly Buckley a few weeks ago and she said always had the, the 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 why i knew i needed to get healthy i just needed to find the how um what was your why what's your journey how did you get here and and where have you been before what what other things have you tried and um i suppose also in that why vegetarian is it a is it a religious family ethical thing um without going into too much detail but yeah that was I'll, something i'll start with wanted to know with the why vegetarian or how vegetarian. I've been a vegetarian for more than 50 years. Um, since I was around five years old, um, in kindergarten, we went to a dairy farm and the meat department of a food store. Yep. And I went home and said, I'm not hungry. <laughs> I'm and, never uh, eating meat in my life. Yeah, my mom is a psychotherapist and she thought if she didn't force me to eat meat, I'd get over it. And uh, obviously you that's not never the got case. Over it. I never got over it. My sister became a vegetarian, my younger sister, and uh, but my parents ate meat my whole life. And my mom always tried to make uh, nutritious food for me. I remember her always talking about the essential amino acids and she wow. would try and sneak uh, raw eggs into shakes for me. And I, I mean, you know, from a very young age, um, my kids are both vegetarians. Oh. They were, they've been vegetarians since they were born, but my husband eats meat. Okay. And uh, I, I mean, my kids are vegetarians, but it's not their primary um, sense of self. Okay. But it is for me. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, and really uh, yeah, and I mean, I, you are, you're not about to change that even to, to dial in your, nutrient density obviously figured you, you had a real passion to work around that constraint potentially to, to dial in your nutrient density regardless. Yeah. I mean, as a kid, people would ask me if I was on a deserted island and I had only meat to eat, uh, would I eat it or would I die? And I always felt like I would die. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, it was that extreme for me. And yeah. I, I mean, Throughout, I've wanted to lose weight for a long time. And I, I uh, you know, many times during the, 
the years before people said if you you know if you're willing to try this if you're willing mm. to eat this but i never was <laughs> yeah interestingly um also had a chat to ted Damon a few weeks ago and we both grew up in a seventh day adventist home environment not the same home on different ends of the world but um mm -hmm. yeah i grew up as a vegetarian until i was in sort of early high school and then ventured off into really? meat and then I, then I found paleo and uh you know my world changed a little bit after i encountered rob wolf but um yeah we definitely have a we want to cut through the, the the diet wars of it all being about plants versus animals or, or whatever it is because you can create a very nutrient poor plant-based diet and you can create a very nutrient poor animal-based diet potentially as well um, we just want to show people how within their constraints they can dial in the nutrient density to get the, get the results they want so you've been through a bit of a, a, a journey i think you had a yes a long I, story from fasting and a whole lot of different diet well, i did lots of diets i did weight watchers and i lost weight and then i stopped weight watchers and it's like instantaneously gained wow. weight again you didn't really um, learn anything about um how to eat that helped you well it was more that i was um, I was keeping myself from eating certain things for a period of time and I hadn't changed how I ate. And uh, then I did, uh, it's a diet in Ontario that's uh, covered by OHIP, our, our um, health plan. Mm. And that was called Dr. Poon's and it was uh, low carb and low fat ultra low carb, ultra low fat. Wow. But there was no mention of uh, increasing protein so it was what do you, what like, do you eat if you got low fat low carb i ate very little i <laughs> ate lots of leafy green vegetables and i was starving all the time wow. um and again you know like he a couple months later i gained all that back and i think probably more so mm. and then i did a diet um called always hungry which is <laughs> relatively low doesn't sound like a good diet always no. hungry <laughs> <laughs> with a professor from Harvard and okay. uh, I didn't lose a pound on that and oh. um, then he suggested that I try keto so okay. uh, I read a bunch of keto books and I tried doing keto as a vegetarian and I didn't lose a pound wow. um, nothing happened and then uh, I found I read the obesity code and I <laughs> Uh, started fasting and I was actually a patient of mm. um, Megan and uh, Dr. Fung and yep. I lost weight fasting. I lost okay. probably 30, around 30 pounds. Wow. And uh, for a while that was great. Um, but then I stopped losing and, uh, you know, like they were pretty good at coming up with things that I could change. I tried every kind of fast you could imagine. I mean, I fasted for 18 days. I fasted mm. for, um, you know, five days at a time, week after week after week. I fat, I did uh, 42 hour fasts three times a week. Um, I tried, oh, and, and any day that I ate, I fasted at least 18 hours. Uh, but what I found towards the end was that I, um, I was so hungry when I started to eat. And also, Actually, I never, a lot of people fast and they describe not being hungry when they fast. Mm -hmm. But I mean, even 17 days in, I was hungry all the time fasting. Mm. And uh, so it's never really raised enough for the fat mobilization, never quite happened to the point that you lost your appetite. Well, my ketones were pretty high. I mean, I saw yeah. Megan um, one time, at, you know, like after like 12 days or 13 days. And she guessed, she said they were like seven or eight, Whoa. something like that. They were really high, but I was yep. still hungry. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I really don't understand why. Yeah. Um, I did a seven day fast once and towards the end of it, my ketone meter was giving HI because it only reads to eight. So it must have been over eight. So that was a interesting point to be. It's sort of euphoric when you fast that long, but um yeah what you eat I was excited. after that point yeah, it's, yeah it, I, there's a euphoria when you get extended fasting and uh you know ketones are really high especially the first few times but yeah 
Yeah, no, but um, in the end, what happened was that I, you know, like I started doing three times 42 hour fasts and in between those fasts, it's, it's as if I couldn't stop eating. I had course after course after course. And wow. then I fast again and I wasn't losing any weight. And I mean, it almost felt like I was starting to develop an eating disorder and overeating had never been my problem. Wow. I mean, my, my problem had always been, I, I think too many carbs and maybe too much fat, yep. um, but primarily too many carbs. <laughs> and uh, so it started to feel really useless. I mean, it was torture for me to fast. And I, and I wasn't losing any weight. Especially if you're not making the progress. Right. And then when I stopped fasting, I started gaining weight immediately. Wow. Wow. It was at the beginning of COVID and my daughter started making fancy desserts. <laughs> <laughs> she Everybody was watching, struggled through COVID lockdown. <laughs> yeah. She was watching the British Bake Off shows and she was trying to make the, you know, emulate all of the fanciest desserts and I was eating them. <laughs> No, so a lot of people added a fair bit of alcohol to that as well and without moving and getting out to go to work or anything. Yeah, it's a fairly interesting time in terms of weight gain. Yes, yes. Yeah. So um, Geraldine Carroll, who uh, yeah. was my fasting partner in, oh, really? uh, uh, yeah, we would fast together. Yeah. Um, I, I, we've actually never met in person. And, uh, but we've been in touch and fasting together for, I don't know, three or four years now. And uh, she found you and probably talked to me about you for a year before <laughs> I um, expressed any interest in trying any of it. Cool. Um, yeah, it's so cool. You came in and, and you just got so motivated. So, so what does your definition of a vegetarian diet look like? I know there's you know, Indians um, have different version to probably Americans. And so for you, what does a vegetarian diet look like? So I eat no meat, fish or poultry. Yep. I eat eggs because they're unfertilized. Yep. Um, I eat cheese as long as it's made with microbial enzymes and doesn't contain animal rennet or lipase. Okay. Um, and I eat lots of vegetables. Yeah. Wow. It's obviously very, very intentional for you and there's no way we can go even if you get more bioavailable protein from animal sources that wouldn't sway you. And there's obviously a lot of people like that who um, you know, I talked to a, Indian podcast recently and you know they that's their religion that's their identity and and you know if, if that's the case then yeah let's find a way to dial that in you can't just say your diet is rubbish but let's get you all the nutrients that you need within that parameter and I love that you've absolutely rocked it um yeah so uh, how I did like you get to <laughs> what, what's that I like that too. Yeah, yeah. So, so why you obviously the people that get to the top of the leaderboard, you don't need to get to the top of the leaderboard. You just need to make a little bit of progress forward. But the people at the top of the leaderboard, like Kelly and City and uh, Jane, sort of they put a lot of effort into it. But it becomes a, a game that becomes you know they get addicted to this gamification of nutrition and solving the puzzle. Um, what, what was your journey there? Why did you, you seem to want to prove that a vegetarian diet could be incredible as well, but what was your motivation? What, what was the moment that took you from maybe this is a thing, maybe nutrient density is, is real to I'm going to smash this and uh, top the leaderboard and do everything I can and pull out all the stops. Well, uh, Yolanda was in the group early yep. on and yep. she had scores of around 95 Yep. And I think until that moment, I didn't actually think it was possible as a vegetarian to have, I, I really thought that I'd have 70 or 75 and that that was the limit, you know, mm. like that was the ceiling of what a vegetarian could get. And somehow seeing her up there, I don't know, it was, it was very inspiring to me. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And then I spent really the rest of the challenge trying to figure out how I could get up, you know, higher and higher. And uh, 
I mean, I did it in my own way, very different than I think everyone else in the group, because I spent a lot of time doing research. Mm. I, I was constantly looking for new foods. I was calling companies. I was trying Some, to figure yeah. out the micronutrients of foods that weren't in the database and, yep. you know, like getting down to all of the, I wanted credit for all of the nutrients, <laughs> like, you know, like when I found hemp protein in it, I knew that hemp contained a lot of nutrients and the yep. hemp proteins that were out there didn't have all of the um, micronutrients listed. Yeah. So I started looking for research studies and mm. finding um, mushrooms that were enhanced with vitamin D in Canada, or uh, it, it seemed impossible. And uh, I mean, I called mushroom farmers, I called uh, people, I called world experts at, <laughs> at, in mushrooms, I, call, I sent emails, I just have an honorary PhD at the States. end of this. Yeah, I mean, I took it to the nth degree. I looked at I buying lamps for lizards because apparently those have the the right um, wavelength for mushrooms, so that I could do it myself. It's unreal. <laughs> and then somebody sent me um, a bag of mushroom powder um, for free, actually, because yep. I was so passionate about it. And then I found mushrooms in Canada that were uh, high in vitamin D, finally. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, you really need to seek out particularly vitamin D. Vitamin D is hard to get in food regardless, but then um, B12, omega-3 can be a bit harder on a plant-based diet to dial in and buy available protein. But, um, yeah, I mean, for people watching, you don't have to go to this length you just need to make a step forward. But uh, yeah, maybe we can talk later about your recommendations for people who just want to take the first step and, you know, they may get addicted, they may not, but just moving down the, the path of nutrient density. Um, so so what what did you find the hardest about the process? Was there anything that I just get sucked in and just kept on gamifying it and playing with the numbers? I mean, really, for me, the hardest thing was the first day of pricking my finger. It was started I, fasting. I, yes, I, uh, I, I think that that kept me. That was part of the reason I didn't do the program earlier, yep. and uh, it kept me up the night before. <laughs> I was worried about it. Uh, now, I mean, it kind of seems silly, but yeah. but after the first prick, I was okay. But I didn't yep. really, you know, it. I, I guess I, you know, it, it may be related to not cutting meat on yeah, a plate okay. because I don't really, the idea of, of cutting something or pricking something myself seemed hard. Mm, mm, and, mm. Uh, but once I realized it was just pulling something, you know, like back a spring and it does it kind of automatically, it wasn't an issue for me anymore. It's pretty simple with the little, uh, glucose monitor no no cgm required um yeah uh so how did you find yeah uh, a lot of people struggle with that initial anxiety and but then you have to go well back stop taking 20 tests a day <laughs> you don't need all that data chill out um how did you find changing from extended fasting um that sort of approach to data-driven fasting uh, what was the difference um yeah, How, what was the difference in experience? We, we, they're both sort of called fasting, but they're a different animal, really. Well, I, to me, data-driven fasting was more about eating. I mean, mm. it was less about fasting and more about finding the right foods to eat. Mm. And uh, I mean, I struggled a bit with uh, my blood sugar because as soon as I got hungry, my blood sugar would go up. Okay. Um, so ever. I get to trigger sometimes, but yep. more often than not, I'd get close to trigger and then it would start to rise. Yeah. Um, you, you get sort of a stress cortisol response sometimes or you start to think about food and the, livers, uh, the, the liver starts to release glycogen. So you need, really need to, that's what data-driven fasting is about, is capturing that dip in your blood sugars and eating then and giving your body what it, refueling at that exact point with what your body needs at that point so um yeah don't don't wait longer than you need to and push through the pain and uh, i think a lot of people with extended fasting just like you said they, they go i don't feel hunger anymore i don't have any i've lost touch with my hunger or they're, they're eating 
really high fat keto and they're getting 4,000 calories a day thinking they're keeping their blood sugars flatline and with no insulin, but they're not getting the results they want, unfortunately. So, Right. So for me, it was, uh, I guess there was an element that was abstract about it. You have to kind of take a leap of faith and decide when, even if your blood sugar isn't exactly where it should be, when you should eat and when you should not. So I struggled a bit with that. Um, but the moderators all helped. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, we got a lovely gang Sue of people from along. Yeah, Sue's listening in. So Linda's amazing. She's a she's a crack up. Um, they, yeah. So that was for me. That was um, that was challenging. Um, I think that was uh, you know that was the most difficult thing is to figure out when I should actually eat. Mm. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, what I ate, I mean, I got a lot of advice about increasing protein. And once I started to increase protein, it was kind of a slow process. It took mm. me, I think, you know, over the first two challenges, I kept working at it. Mm. And uh, then, but very quickly, I found that I didn't need to eat everything in, in front of me. It's like, after fasting, I was devouring food. And uh once I increased protein, I didn't need to do that anymore. And the issue of overeating went away very quickly, uh, within wow. weeks. Wow. Yeah, that was so, incredible. So important to retrain your hunger signals and um, give your body what it needs. And, like, yeah, when I, yeah, everybody finds it, but when you give your body those foods that don't provide the nutrients, it just keeps on wanting more more food more energy to get the nutrients it needs and you're just never satisfied never satiated and want to keep on eating and eating and if you just give it what it needs and you obviously found a way to get the protein on a on a vegetarian diet and um yeah. and smashed it which is really really it's really important um yeah you can definitely get adequate protein on a vegetarian diet but it's just a little bit harder with you know protein density and bioavailability, bio but you've proved that you can definitely do it. Um, so going back to Yolanda, I don't know, Frank, and, you know, there's a few people who come into the masterclass. Uh, you, know, you mentioned your mum as a, just say, psychotherapist or a uh -huh. counsellor. Um, just interested in your opinion on this. I've always wondered what is it about the mentality of those people that, that jump in and go, I understand this, I can smash it, and they, they, they don't, they hardly need to be tutored. Yolanda just jumped in, read the manual, started using Nutrient Optimizer, and she had scores at 95. And what are those characteristics and how could we model them and, and, and sort of train them and say these are the habits you need to practice from a, neuro-linguistic programming point of view. I've, I've wondered that to, to help people take the process of, of nutritional optimization a little bit quicker. Any thoughts there? Well, I mean, I think Yolanda studied the, the guides ahead of time. Uh, I asked her <laughs> when I first met her, I, I said, how many times have you done the master class? None. Because, right, it seemed like she had done it before. And uh, I mean, it seemed very important to her to, mm. you know, to really smash it. Um, mm. it. I didn't feel the same way. I mean, when I started, I just kind of wanted it to wash over me. I figured mm. I'd get whatever I'd get and I wouldn't, whatever I didn't get, I didn't get. Um, somehow I got caught by, with the bug later on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's important to not. later on. Just Play, play it as an adventure and uh, and be a curious student. And if you overthink it and feel like a failure in any of this, you fall off and you just got to keep chipping away and, and moving forward a little bit. Um, so, so what surprised you about the process? What did you, what did you go, wow, this is, I didn't didn't expect to, to see this or, or feel this or think this? Well, I really didn't expect to even like the class. I, <laughs> it wasn't something... <laughs> I, I did it because I there was a gap. Um, the data driven fasting ended, and yep. uh, I just thought that I didn't want to be hanging out there doing nothing. I liked the people that I was doing the program with, 
And uh, so I signed up for that, but I, I really thought that my food, I ate unprocessed foods, I cooked at home. I, I, I didn't really understand um, that my diet wasn't healthy, though mm. I knew that, uh, I mean, I've had health issues, I had breast cancer. And mm. um, looking back on it, I think that it was largely metabolic. Um, mm. And I, I knew that I had weight issues, mm. but somehow I didn't, uh, I didn't put that together with this program is going to help me. Mm. And so I was really surprised very early on that, um, that small tweaks in my diet could make a big difference. Mm. And uh, I mean, I think that really surprised me. And for me, it was a process. I moved up, um, you know, like my score, it wasn't in big jumps. It was a point or two mm -hmm. at a time. And mm -hmm. I just kept, you know, like looking, I, I it was like a puzzle. And I yeah. just kept adding things and taking things off and understanding it better and uh, making small changes. I mean, one change, one change that I made, I was drinking coffee in the morning with almond milk. And Frank yeah. said, almond milk is junk. <laughs> and I knew that. I mean, I knew that it was like a fake food, especially if you buy it and don't make mm. it yourself. But even if you make it yourself, I always knew that it was, it had no protein in it mm. and that it was fortified. And so he said it was junk. And I said, well, what should I drink instead? And then I started um, having my my lattes in the morning with oat milk, which was not much better, but it tasted better. And uh, and then um, Bob suggested using um, lactose free, the Fair Life lactose free, nonfat milk. Okay. And, I mean, it was a little change of co yeah. in my coffee at the in the morning, but I was eating a real food. Yeah. And I was getting 14 grams of protein in oh, that wow. one change. So, wow. I mean, and a whole bunch of, you know, like essential amino acids because it's a yeah. complete protein yeah. and it's low sugar and um, low fat. Yeah. And so, I think look, it's a really big deal that it's the tiny changes. It's the incremental changes. It's, you know, not jumping. You don't, we don't. So here's a menu that you eat for two weeks and then at the end you realize you hate it and you're hungry and you, you bounce back. It's like, where are, you, where are you now and how can we move that forward just a little bit and how can you tweak and fine-tune your diet from where you start? And I think that's really powerful. Um, yeah, th this is, do, do you want to talk about your micronutrient fingerprint? I don't think everybody understands what this means, but um, it's all the essential nutrients um, and this is 100% of the optimal nutrient intake per 2,000 calories. So it's a measure of nutrient density or food quality. So you could get a perfect score with 1,000 calories or 3,000 calories, but people who dial up the nutrient density just seem to get smashed with satiety and these foods are really hard to overeat. So it's a, it's a really nice hack to dial in your micronutrient density and get not just a protein leverage effect, but a nutrient leverage effect that as you dial in the nutrients you need, cravings diminish and fall off. And um, yeah, everything kicks in. The, the, the red here is amino acids. Most people on a omnivorous diet probably have a dominant amount of amino acids. Um, you still got a good amount of uh, vitamin A and B12 is probably one of the harder ones and omega-3 was a bit harder, but you definitely got them in and, and hit the optimal nutrient intake, not not the minimum to prevent, prevent diseases of deficiency, but you got the optimal across the board. And I think it's the first time I've ever seen this perfect score of 100%. So <laughs> congratulations. So, and you, you broke our system again. Yeah, well, I had trouble. I mean, if I look at the, the list, uh, the ones at the top were really the hardest ones to get. I mean, yeah. B1 and B3 were really hard. Mm. Um, I didn't have too much trouble with omega-3, but I had trouble with zinc. Mm. And oddly, I don't see where sodium is. Sodium was a struggle. Mm. Uh, 
because I thought that you were going to subtract added salt. So I don't really add a lot of salt to my food, okay. but but finding um, good sources of sodium was a bit of a struggle. A lot of people use sauerkraut or whatever, which I comes did sauerkraut added. pickles. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. So, so where did you get your B12 and omega-3? Um, B12, I wrote it down, eggs, milk, and whey protein. Okay. If you're um, eating eggs, B12 is not a biggie. Right, right. Um, actually, the hardest ones I found were B1 and B3. Okay. Those were really the hardest. And B1, I, um, it was hemp protein, was okay. really good. And then a city... Um, talked about moringa leaves yeah. that she had growing in her garden. And uh, the day that she mentioned them, she mentioned it in reference to B1. And I did a massive search in Canada, in, in here to find moringa leaves. And I found a, a Filipino supermarket that, had, that flew them in twice a week. And I'm sure it must be the only source of moringa leaves in Canada. And I found it. And uh, the first day I cooked it, she told me they were really strong. It's also called um, horseradish leaves. Yep. And the Indians eat a, a lot of it. The, the um, pods are called drumsticks. Yep. And uh, anyway, I, I bought um, a big pack of it and I cooked it like spinach and I was sick the entire next day <laughs> did you ate too much of it i ate way too much i think i had 200 grams oh, it was wow. way way too much um yeah. and i mean i like horseradish and i like uh, hot sauce and but for whatever reason i i'm i'm not even sensitive about foods in general but i really felt sick for the entire next day no so then i started um I started drying it. So I would buy it and put it in my dehydrator and then adding it to my shakes. I love and it. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that just like, I mean, I added very little, like three grams a day to my shakes. And um, I think it had a big impact on my waking blood sugar. Oh, that was a mushroom shake. Okay. That mushroom was only a one-time thing. That, that sounds like an interesting experiment. Yeah, most people... When they go, oh, your spinach is at the top of the list, they'll add a whole lot of spinach and they whack 100 grams of spinach and they go, oh, my God, I just can't tolerate that much spinach. So it's a matter of, you know, you can't tolerate or you can't actually eat that much of those nutrient-dense foods and you might be able to get 30 calories of spinach in your diet because it's just the energy density is so low. So uh, once you've got all the green non-starchy veggies you need to sort of start to move down and try to find a few more energy dense foods that you can actually tolerate before you explode like a cow and too much clover i have no trouble with 200 grams of spinach okay but, you, you're <laughs> but 200 well grams of moringa was a little tough for me wow wow so so data-driven fasting versus the the master class um there are a lot together and a lot of people who do them the few people who attempt it go well that was a brain explosion because it's sort of complementary approaches but you seem to bring it together and find them complementary what what did you learn from one versus the other and why are they both helpful for you well with the data-driven fasting i really um learned about protein I mean, mm -hmm. to increase my protein and uh, I found a way to stop overeating. <laughs> I mean, that was the biggest thing. That it's the I holy grail, out. isn't it, of, of nutrition? It, it's not being hungry all the time. I wasn't hungry. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I was, I was able to eat two meals a day and uh, I didn't lose weight during the, really during the first two. I think I lost a few pounds on the second wow. day to driven fasting. But I made so many changes to my diet, and uh, it just felt like they needed to be made, and that was very mm. good. Uh, mm. For me, I mean, everything happened in the master class. I, wow. uh, it, I don't know. I would wake up in the morning excited, and I stayed <laughs> excited for the entire day. And I mean, I, I felt it. alive in a way that I haven't felt in a long time. I was so wow. motivated. Wow. And, uh, I mean, you just loved the process. It was amazing. I loved just it. I loved the interaction. It wasn't a, with, wasn't a chore at all. 
with the group. I mean, I know some people felt really intimidated early on. There was a lot of discussion about that, but somehow I was okay with whatever I got out of it. It didn't, um, there yeah. was never a moment that I was worried about, uh, you know, would I get it or not get it? It didn't really matter. Whatever yeah. I got was okay. And Yeah, uh, I think this round we found too many people got obsessed with competing for the top of the leaderboard, and that's hard if you're a first timer. So next time we're going to actually take out the leaderboard from the Nutrient Optimizer app, so you can't actually see where you are. So people just focus on where are they now and how can they move forward, like you said. And you get there eventually at your own pace, and some people quicker, some people. But if you just move a little bit down the road, you get massive improvements. Um, so, so what do you eat less of now? And what do you eat more of? What, what what foods did you find that you eliminated because you had to fit in other foods? Oh, um, well, I really reduced my fat intake to practically nothing. And, you know, I stopped adding fat when I cooked my eggs. I would just do a quick spray of the pan um, with some olive oil spray or uh, avocado oil. I stopped eating avocados. I stopped eating massive amounts of cheese. Um, I, I mean, I really lived on cheese before yeah. uh, when I was doing the, the fasting and I, I don't think it did me any favors, but yeah. it was really hard for me to stop. I yeah. mean, it was like, I love cheese. Mm. And, uh, love, love, really love, love. love. People really love the nuts and cheese and dairy. And it's a, it's that dopamine hit that's associated with it because it gives you the energy that your amygdala knows you're going to survive so um yeah it's really hard to give it up especially when cognitively you've given yourself free permission to eat it as a free food because it keeps your blood sugar stable and theoretically doesn't raise insulin and rah rah, rah. It, oh i it, loved it, that fat as a free food thing <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. yeah it was if, if only it was true <laughs> I know. I gave up cream too. My husband, the, the whole time I was saying fat is free, uh, was saying, no, it isn't. <laughs> He'd say, that's bullshit. <laughs> Does he go near, 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 near now? <laughs> I was buying uh, heavy cream by the liter full wow. and uh, adding it to my coffee. I dilute it um, to make my lattes, but actually, that was where I started before I went to the almond milk. <laughs> yeah, we and, used to buy these kilo tubs of this grass-fed butter on from these amazing cows with salt, and it used to taste amazing, and I'd mix it with the peanut butter, and, you know, you know, this is good for me. I'm chasing ketones, and it tasted incredible, and but it's not doesn't help with fat loss, so unfortunately. No. <laughs> so I, I, can't, I can't turn off my pancreas like my wife. Yeah, so I gave up a lot of fat. I mean, I even went to, I, I always ate a lot of salads, and often I would have salad for breakfast, um, or as part of my breakfast, but I went from really dousing it with dressing to dribbling tiny little drops mm. and adding mm. lots of vinegar, like balsamic mm. vinegar, um, and maybe nutritional yeast, which I mm. later cut out as well, so yeah, that I could right. get to the top of the leaderboard. <laughs> Yeah, we um, there was a bit of an argument in the group about, you know, can we add this and this and how do we do it with the vegetarian diet if we can't use these? And it's like, oh, we, we really want to focus on whole foods, not creating supplement stacks. And, yeah, so. Yeah. Well, I learned a, a lot about nutritional yeast, though, in the process because I started calling the company that manufactures it to find out about, and apparently – B12 is not naturally occurring in nutritional mm. yeast. And I had always Definitely. eaten it thinking I was getting B12, mm. but mine had none in it. And uh, yeah. so I it can definitely a lot. Like, it gives you all the B vitamins that are hard to obtain on a vegetarian diet. So it's really good for a, a vegan vegetarian diet to get those B vitamins that are usually found in, in meat and seafood. But yeah. Yeah. So I cut that out. Um, what else did I cut? I guess that's basically what I cut out. And uh, I added a bunch of new foods. I added the moringa. Mm. I added yerba mate, which um, was initially it tasted very grassy to me. And then it's bitter, isn't it? It's an acquired taste. It's nice. Yeah. I, 
eventually I started, someone in the group recommended making it like chai. And so mm. every morning I would add a lot of spices and uh, use my mortar and pestle. And I kind of made it into a ritual. Mm. So it was really fun. And I was thinking that, you know, I don't form habits easily, but if I made it into something fun, that it would be more likely to be long lasting. And mm. so I started to really enjoy that part of the program, the drinking my yerba mate after my coffee. Yeah. And uh, what else did I add? I added mushrooms. Mm. I have had I kind of a protein and a vegetarian diet. Yeah, I've had a lifelong aversion to mushrooms. <laughs> but here you are. You're sunning yeah. your mushrooms with the lizard lamp to get your vitamin D. <laughs> I ate mushrooms. And it wasn't just for vitamin D because they're high in lots of nutrients. And some that are really hard, I'll tell you which, uh, vitamin D was the big one, but also B3. Mm. And uh, I mean, mushrooms made a big impact even without the vitamin D, it would increase my score by uh, around two points. Mm. And wow. that was probably one of the biggest hits that I ever mm. got from changing foods. Um, so what about protein? What's the, the, that's potentially the hardest on a, especially a plant-based vegetarian is easier, but um, what do you right. eat protein on a, on a vegetarian diet? So I've got some photos of your food here too that you sent through. Right. So for me, I mean, my fundamental food is cottage cheese. Uh, yeah. I really love it and I have it pretty much every day. And uh, I mean, I buy a special cottage cheese that's fl that's flown in to a store here from Poland and <laughs> it costs like $10 for 500 grams. It's very expensive and I absolutely love it. Um, so I eat that pretty much all the time. I also eat eggs and Greek yogurt or skier. Uh, mm. Now it's non-fat Greek yogurt or skier. Um, I, I mean, I have protein powder. Probably I would, uh, I switch from whey protein to primarily hemp protein, okay. um, which is really just defatted hemp seeds. So mm. they take out the, I, it took a little getting used to, and uh, but it has a lot of nutrients that, you can't get from the other protein sources. Cool. And uh, I mean, edamame is pretty low fat and high, high protein, tofu, tempeh, um, what else? And nutritional yeast. Mm. And here I have uh, on the bottom, there's mushrooms. A lot of mushrooms. Yes, a lot of mushrooms and a lot of spinach. But the mushroom I made with uh, peanut sauce and I used okay. the, um, defatted peanut powder, like the I think it's uh, P two B or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, PB two. PB two. Yeah, it's really good. If you, I love peanut butter, so it's good to sometimes mix with the lower fat yogurt, high protein yogurt, because that's my kryptonite. Is the peanut butter and yogurt? It's just like the perfect lizard. Oh, I haven't had that. I'm, I'm, trying that. Food. I'm going to get everybody addicted to my uh, my kryptonite. But yeah, that, that, that's what I go to after a lot of lifting or workouts or, or long walking or just comfort foods. So yeah, I'd be leaner so if you I didn't have regular peanut butter. Ah, uh, yeah, this is stuff that um, there's a place at King Arroy about three hours north of where we are that ships their nuts to New Zealand to, and we discovered these um, uh, is it picks really good peanut butter when we were in New Zealand and they make it and ship it back over here and it's just the best peanut butter in the world and uh, yeah that, that's that's my uh, my go-to when I when I need to pick me up so yeah well I like um, there's uh, this chocolate that they sell at Trader Joe's in the United States that's called Montezuma 100% black chocolate. They, oh, wow. they buy it. It's uh, made in the UK and shipped to Trader Joe's. And it's uh, it has no sugar in it at all, but it has fat. And that with a, a little bit of peanut butter on top is so good. <laughs> but I cut back a lot on that too. <laughs> Especially in the final week of the masterclass where you're competing. Um, so do you use any, have you used any supplements and do you use supplements now? Or what's your approach there? So I've a, always a had a, a strong aversion to supplements. Um, 
not because I think that they're bad for you, but I don't really believe in them. Mm. And uh, I've never really felt that you could take a pill to make up for food. Mm. Mm. And I, I almost have like a physical, I have no trouble swallowing anything, but I can't get myself to take the vitamin, you know, mm. vitamins and pills. I, I mean, I can take aspirin or Tylenol or, mm. but I really struggle to take uh, magnesium or zinc or B complex. I have, uh, I would buy them and then take them for a week or two and stop. Wow. And uh, so it's really thrilling to me that I can get all my nutrients from food and I don't have to yeah. take them anymore. Yeah, that, that, that's part of the masterclass where we want people to realize that, hey, I don't need to be paying for all these supplements anymore. I can save all this money invested in food. And you've talked about buying really high quality food and enjoying it, but you don't have to spend a ton of money. You can if you can buy the best quality food you can afford that you enjoy that is grown well, that helps the environment, et cetera, et cetera. I'm a big believer in investing in regenerative agriculture and, and not just massive large scale monocropping and et cetera, et cetera. But um, yeah, you don't have to don't have to start there. So how do you feel before and after? Has your nutrient density changed the way you feel other than being obsessed with uh, dialing in your nutrient density as a game and getting up, having a, having a fun challenge every day? Yeah, well, I mean, the biggest change is I feel hopeful. I mean, that's really the, the biggest thing. I feel like, I, I mean, I'm not there yet with my weight. I, you know, but I feel like you made a lot of there. progress over the last few months, though. Massive 10, 10 and a half percent of your body weight loss. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope I'll make more more progress over the next couple of months. But I feel like it's not just that I'll I might get to my goal, but it's that I can stop thinking about endlessly about my diet. And uh, I mean, I. I've always worried about what, what was wrong with my diet. Am I eating too much fat? Am I eating too many carbs? And I never imagined that the issue was that I wasn't getting enough protein. I, I, I mean, it's like, it was always a, a struggle between too many fat, too much fat, too many carbs. Uh, mm -hmm. I, it didn't even enter my head that, that protein was the issue. <laughs> Once you get enough protein, the carbs and fat argument just falls away becomes yeah. irrelevant right because when you eat a lot of protein you can't really eat that much else <laughs> i mean it, it was quite amazing i if if you eat i mean i for me i have to eat the protein first because yeah. if i eat the carbs and the fat then i don't want the protein mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that was kind of a learning experience to figure out that you know i can't wait to eat my hard-boiled eggs after i have my salad and whatever else I'm going to eat, the vegetables, because, I, you know, after that, I really didn't want it. Mm. Um, but if I ate it first, I, I didn't need to eat a lot of the carbs and I didn't mm. miss the fat. Yeah, you're not raiding the fridge and the cupboard for those comfort foods anymore because your body's happy. Yeah, yeah. I, I love how it works. Actually, how, we, how we've seen it in the data in real life people. I just love talking. I'm just loving talking to all these people that, you know, you may be a unique snowflake and you've got these issues that nobody else has got, but let's be real, you're probably not. And if you just follow the data that everybody else, that works for everybody else, you're likely to, to rock it like you have. And uh, it's just great to see people take that journey and, follow the system that's all based on quantitative analysis of, of a lot of people's real life data. Well, the other thing is that while it's really difficult to dial in all the nutrients, the micronutrients on your own with your tools, it was, it was really easy. Mm. I mean, it, it really made it possible to figure mm. out what to, you know, like what this change, what the impact of each of the changes was. Yeah. And it was interesting because there were, um, you know, like I could eat a little bit more of something and my score would go down. Mm. And, uh, you know, it, it was surprising sometimes because eating more of a good food wasn't necessarily good. Mm. Mm. I, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, it just allows you to 
get a truly balanced diet at a micronutrient level as you just, you know, get a little bit more of that to get the nutrients you need there and you don't need too much of that. And then you, it sends you chasing the, the harder to find nutrients, which is just right. an ongoing process of refinement. Right. And I mean, if I had too much of, uh, you know, like more of something that was good, but I was still missing something else, mm. uh, my score wouldn't go up. It might go down. Mm. Mm. Um, so, and one thing uh, I, while I loved the master class, I felt like I was eating all the time. <laughs> Cause it's so much food. It was so much food. Yeah. I mean, I think because it was so much food. I would, I, I prepared food for hours. I mean, that was me. It's yeah. obviously not necessary, but um, I ate for what seemed like so much every day. And I was thinking that, you know, like, if I could just have a score of 90, I could just, you know, eat less, which was when we went back to the data-driven fasting, I could yeah. eat a little less. Yeah. And that was good too. That's and, probably one I of mean, the I wasn't eating a lot of calories during yeah. the master class, and I was losing lots of weight, mm. but it still felt like a lot of food to me. Yeah, wow. Um, yeah, and that's probably one of the challenges with a plant-based diet is to get enough calories you need to eat a lot of food unless you're packing it with oil and flour and sugar which is uh the evil end of the plant-based spectrum sort of the best nutrient dense foods are plant-based and and the worst that most people eat all the time are plant-based as well so just that plant-based label i think is completely useless and usually used to just sell process slop that doesn't help people so it's you know I'm, I'm really passionate about seeing people like you who follow a plant-based vegetarian diet dial in nutrient density in that parameter if they're passionate about it then this is great so to wrap up what um what would you tell karen three months ago starting out on the journey or or somebody like you just wanting to to start out you know you're you know, eating all these amazing foods and, and investing in good food and spending money making incredible food that you've designed yourself and you love eating and you've got to sort of nutritional nirvana of 100%. But, um, you know, for somebody who feels intimidated by that, what advice would you give them just to take that first step? How, how would you guide them? Well, I mean, the the hundred was just for it was a game. It was fun. <laughs> it was motivating to me, but it's not necessary. Yeah. I mean, I I think that the the small incremental changes were I, I mean enormous, and mm. you don't have to go to to a hundred at all. I mean, if you go from I I probably started at thirty. And even though my my numbers don't show that because I wasn't logging my food in chronometer, but um, I mean you just have to make small changes and it has a huge impact on life. I think. And uh, I mean, uh, my advice is everyone should take the master class. I mean, to me, it was magical. It was so much fun. The group was amazing. I learned so much that I. I I mean, it was really, really, really fun. And uh, and I think it'll have a lifelong impact for me. I mean, to me, the biggest thing is that I always thought that a vegetarian diet wasn't healthy. I mean, uh, since my earliest memory, it was, you know, that, that my diet, I did, I was a vegetarian for, you know, the reasons that I described earlier, but I didn't really feel like it was good for me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really feel people would say that they were, you know, vegetarian and that they were doing it for health. And I never, ever thought that it was a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. um, and now I feel like I can be a vegetarian and healthy. And wow. I mean, that's monumental. And the other thing is that I really felt like during the master class, I had a shift from thinking about losing weight to thinking about uh, increasing the nutrient density mm. of my food. And I stopped thinking about losing weight. 
It wasn't about but that at all. Rather than depriving your body, you're actually going, how can I nourish my body with what it really Absolutely. needs? It's a complete mind shift of how you look at food. It's like food is not bad. I need to deprive myself of all this calories and limit calories and count calories and keep under a limit and fight that limit. You, you're going, how can I nourish my body with the highest quality food? And then everything just falls into place and you go, I'm so full, I'm eating so much food, but I'm losing weight because I'm giving my body what it needs. It was really a paradigm shift. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was kind of like, it was such a relief to stop thinking about losing weight mm. and thinking instead about eating and not about overeating, but just about, mm. you know, like, making food that was interesting and colorful. And I mean, I didn't, a lot of people made really fancy recipes during the masterclass. Uh, Kelly is one of them and she mm. made incredibly interesting things. I didn't she, really do She that. was making head cheese while you were making mushrooms and both at the top of the leaderboard. It's pretty, I just love that. Yeah, that, that but that, I mean, my, my food was so simple uh, during mm. the master class. I mean, it was mostly things I put together. I was cooking for my family and I was cooking separate things for myself. And I was really just trying to get the nutrients I needed as opposed to figuring out, uh, you know, fancy dishes to make. And I, I mean, I'll work on that in other master class classes. And actually part of the reason I wanted to score well is because I wanted to do the master class again and that was the prize. <laughs> that was a big incentive to me. I want to win so I can get another free master class. It's not an yes. <laughs> and it's you not even expensive. You've, 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 you've cracked the uh you've cracked the hundred. You you can't escape because you have to come back and be a moderator and help other people through the journey. Yeah. So, okay. I didn't imagine that that was ever a possibility, but I I thought that if I won at least I could come back. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, anything else you wanted to add? This has been so much fun to chat and just hear your journey and, and how you've responded to the, the programs. Yeah, I'm just going to look at my notes and see if I the, I wrote a whole bunch of notes this afternoon. <laughs> uh, I think I covered everything. Oh, I guess, you know... Uh, I thought that with fasting, that it was like kind of like the end of the line. If you don't eat, can you, if, if you eat nothing, mm. that seems like, you know, if that doesn't work, then there's no possibility then that, that anything else will work. And I mean, it was really surprising to me that there's something better than eating nothing. Uh, you know, that, that, I mean, it's still a, a miracle to me that, that I mean, I was feeling so hopeless because mm. I mean, where can you go from? I, I mean, you you can figure out where to go from Weight Watchers to, you know, like a different diet. But when you're eating nothing, I I mean, for at least two or three years, I ate on uh, far fewer days than I didn't eat. I mean, so where do you go from there? And I still can't believe that there's some place to go that can be that I can be successful. I it, it's really miraculous. You went from not eating for seven. Would you say seventeen days at a at seventeen? A yeah, or or even longer. I mean, I did a, I did seventeen. I think I did ten. I did. Uh, I mean, five days a week, and then eating on the weekend for weeks at a time. Um, I mean, if, if I look at my, I kept, you know, track of all my fasts and I definitely fasted far longer than I ate. <laughs> wow. And you go from that to, there's, there's so much food <laughs> to eat. So, so much. much food. Right. And losing weight now. And losing weight. Better. I know. And not only is it so much food and I'm losing weight, but I, uh, my, I'm getting what I need. I'm getting yeah. the food. I mean, I don't think I've ever gotten all the nutrients that I needed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's really amazing. Yeah. Wow. So thank you. Yeah, no, That's thank so you. Uh, this has been so much fun and uh, just so rewarding to see after the years of building the system and refining the system to just see people using the system. It's, uh, yeah, it's just a joy. 
Um, thank you so much. I, I, I think yeah, after that, there's nothing more to be said, and we can all go home and um, yeah, get on with that day. So thank you so much, and um, yeah, so we got another master uh, another masterclass on twenty second of May, which would be great. And data driven fasting starts today, which is going to be awesome. We got more than a thousand people signed up, and um, no, it's amazing. After, after three years of trying to get people to eat better and uh, teach them about nutrient density, we start talking about fasting, and it blows up. So anyway, as you said, hopefully that'll be a a lead in to help more people learn how to nourish their body at the same time as balancing when they eat. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's wonderful to be a moderator and that there are yeah. so many vegetarians in the group that, yeah. that uh, I, I mean, it'll be interesting to see if the vegans get to the top of the leaderboard. They may. Yeah. I wanted to be triggered by that competitive spirit to prove that their diet is best and come in and do what you've done with the vegetarian diet. And, you know, they, they, they need, Everybody needs nutrients, whether they're on a carnivore or, or vegan diet. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I, and I, I mean, anyone can improve their diet from where mm. they are. So, uh, I uh, the master class was really about that. Mm. Uh, regardless of the leaderboard, it's mm. you know making those changes, and it's uh, it was amazing to see my score go up, and you know know that I not up to the top, but just you know knowing that I was finding nutrients and, uh, you know, in the, and making little shifts. It was great. Mm. Yeah. So thank you. I loved it. Uh, thank you so much, Karen. We'll sign off. Thanks everybody for watching in and uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.